let's start. Uh, today we have uh, Arun with us. Uh, Arun Suresh, who's going to deliver a talk on generators, generators, relations, and the type of backlink of semigroup. He's from Georgia State University, and uh, uh, this is the first lecture of the student seminar series. I hope soon a lot more participants can present, and this is a way for us to learn different uh, part of mathematics and at least get introduced to different parts of mathematics. Uh, Arun, uh, sorry, Arun. Yeah. Can, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'll mute myself. And if anyone has any doubt, feel free to interrupt. Uh, just unmute yourself, ask questions, then mute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can start. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Arun Suresh from Georgia State University. I'm a first year master's student here. And today, my presentation is going to be on the generators, relations, and type of the Bakel and Semi group. Um, this was done mostly as a part of my undergraduate research. So it's not going to be a lot of involved commutative algebra in the sense that there's not going to be a lot of heavy machinery, but it's still a very nice result. And so without further ado, let's just delve in. So um, wait, let's see. So the main object uh, area of study is numerical semigroups and uh, numerical semigroup rings. So uh, to start, a numerical semigroup is just a subset of the natural numbers such that its complement in the natural numbers is finite and it is closed under addition. We say that uh, A1 through AH generate the semigroup if any element of the semigroup can be written as linear combinations of those elements. Um, <clears throat> the, the little h is called the embedding dimension of the semigroup, and for the purposes of this talk, uh, little h is always going to be four. In other words, we're going to be looking at four generated semigroups. Um, another very natural object that we can associate with a semigroup is uh, the numerical semigroup ring, which is just given by uh, k, the field that joined uh, with t to the a, where a comes from the semigroup. And this is like a k subalgebra of k of t. And once we have that, we can also consider uh, this very natural homomorphism from the polynomial ring and h variables to k of t, where we send each of the xi to t to the ai. And it's uh, straightforward that this is like a graded homomorphism. And th I mean, this is a graded uh, k algebra map. And the kernel of this map is called uh, the presentation ideal or the defining ideal. And it's denoted by i sub h. And the cardinality of the minimal generating set, uh, which we will, uh, which will become the main object of study here, or one of the main objects of study here, uh, is denoted by mu of i sub h. Um, so, a few known results about uh, this sort of things is that it is known that the presentation ideal is binomial, and and it is generated by elements like this, where um, this uh, u and v are just n tuples that satisfy this very oh that that should have been a h not an n sorry that's just my bad so n h um, that's but they're just h tuples that satisfy this uh, very nice uh, relation and it's kind of natural uh, because you would expect that from this homomorphism uh, where you send x i to t to the a i um, so these are all like homogeneous binomial homogeneous binomials. Uh, where we have uh, this sort of like an exponent tuple. Uh, we know that the projective dimension of this semigroup ring for this particular case where the embedding dimension is five, uh, is four, uh, the projective dimension is three. Uh, and this can be seen in like many ways. The easiest one would be to use the auslander bushbaum formula. And uh, that's uh, pretty straightforward. And since the projective dimension is three, it admits four Betty numbers. And uh, yeah, anyone have a question? Or Okay. Can so, you just uh, tell people what is Betty numbers? Yeah. Uh, so uh, a Betty number, so here we say that the nth Betty number is the cardinality of n, uh, the nth syzygy, but that's just, uh, you know, putting one unknown thing in terms of another unknown thing. So what really is a syzygy of, so if you think about it, uh, we can 
think of any element of the presentation ideal as a combination of elements of its minimal generating set, right? And the coefficient, so given an element, uh, the coefficients for the elements from the minimal generating set, they are an element in what we call the module of syzygy. Um, so the first syzygy would just be the minimal generating set, right? Because every element can be written as uh, the, a combination of stuff from the minimal generating set. But then the, the stuff from the minimal generating set are not particularly independent either. So what you can do is you can form relations among them. And uh, you, this forms a, a module of syzygy called the second, well, we call it the second module of syzygy or the second syzygy of k of h and the there's a very nice theorem that uh, that says that this uh, kind of process produces non-trivial syzygies until we hit the projective dimension which is which in this case uh, would be three right and the betty numbers are just the cardinality of the generating sets of each of these syzygies so um there's a another very uh, I would like what the explanation and like the definition that I gave is a little bit hand wavy. It gives you a lot of intuition, but there's a lot, uh, there's a different sort of very theoretical uh, um, definition of the Betty numbers in terms of like the Tor functor and the X functor. Uh, but I'm not going to get into it because it's just a different rabbit hole altogether. But uh, it, it is known that beta zero of, a given semigroup ring is always one. The first Betty number, like we just discussed, was the minimal generating set of IH. And you can continue producing non-trivial Betty numbers until, in this case, you get to beta H minus one or beta three. And this last Betty number is called the Cohen-Macaulay type of K of H. And these syzygies and Betty numbers are kind of important because it helps us produce like uh, minimal free resolutions of K of H, which is sort of an important object of study for a lot of other purposes. Um, so going forward, uh, so here in this last bit, we talked about the Cohen-Macaulay type, or in general, the type of K of H. We can also associate a type for the semigroup H itself, and it's the cardinality of this set. Uh, the PF here stands for pseudo Forbenius numbers. So what is a Forbenius number? Uh, like we discussed first, like uh, the uh, given a numerical semigroup, the complement is always finite, right? So if you take this finite set, this finite set is called the gaps and the largest element in the gaps of the semigroup is called a Forbenius number. So intuitively, any number that is bigger than the Forbenius number has to be a part of the semigroup. So it's the largest number that is non-representable using the generators of the semigroup. So the pseudo Forbenius numbers would just be the complement of H in Z, such that, you know, X plus H is in the semigroup or all H in the semigroup. Um, so this is the set of pseudo Forbenius numbers and the cardinality of the set is defined to be the type of the semigroup. And in one of uh, the recent papers by Stamate, uh, he proves that this, in fact, equals the Cohen-Macaulay type of KFH. Like, they both are the same numbers. So finding the type of H implies finding the type the type and fixed embedding dimensions have always been of interest, but scarce in the literature. Um, so going forward, uh, there's a little bit of more background set up before we delve into the theory. So we take the polynomial ring, we take an ideal inside the polynomial ring, and we are looking at a standard grading on S. So we take, if we take a non-zero polynomial from the ideal, we can define the initial form of the polynomial by taking its non-zero homogeneous part of uh, the least degree. Um, again, it's worth remembering that this is with respect to the standard grading, uh, and I emphasize this because we're going to have two different types of grading here, the non-standard grading, uh, which is uh, this stuff, and then the standard grading, which is the standard grading, right? And now what we can do is once we have the initial form of every uh, binomial or polynomial in I, uh, yeah. Uh, can you uh, tell me what is the non-standard grading here? 
Uh, the non-standard grading is uh, this sort of, where the degree is given by uh, this summation, right? Where the degree of xi is ai. That's the... Okay, okay, fine. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like it's the grading that is induced by this. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. So where was I? Okay, yeah, so now what we can do is find, uh, take the initial form of all of the binomials in I and, you know, form an ideal out of them. And the ideal generated by all of that is the ideal of initial forms. Um, and we say that F1 through FK in I forms a standard basis for I if their initial forms generate the ideal of initial forms. Um, so going forward, another uh, important object of study is the associated graded ring uh, with respect to the maximal ideal given by this. And uh, it's, uh, the, the associated graded ring has a very nice, uh, like direct, it, it's defined to be uh, this sort of a direct sum. And this object is called the tangent cone of the uh, semigroup ring. Um, I, if you want to confirm a lot of the visual intuition behind why this is called the tangent cone and where this is coming from, uh, I think chapter five of Eisenbud has a very nice explanation. I haven't gotten deep into it, but I am planning to. Like this part was more so done uh, inspired by my mentor's work and stuff. So uh, that's there. Uh, but this is important for two reasons. The first reason is that the Betty numbers of this tangent cone of the semigroup ring, uh, they form an upper bound for the Betty numbers of K of H. So if you're looking for the Betty numbers of K of H, uh, and if you're looking for an upper bound for them really, uh, you could go to the associated graded ring. And the nice thing about the associated graded ring is that it's isomorphic to S modeled by uh, the initial form of the presentation ideal. And the Betty numbers here are very nice to calculate or, and compute because they, we have a standard grading here. And it's, it's a lot easier to do that um, when you have a standard grading. And when the Betty numbers of the tangent cone and the Betty numbers of uh, the semigroup ring, when they coincide, uh, the semigroup ring is called to be said to be of homogeneous type. So the first Betty number and a lot of efforts uh, in this project is really directed into getting the first Betty number because if you remember, uh, the first Betty number is the cardinality of the minimal generating set. So if we can get our hands on what the minimal generating set is, we can get the first Betty number, but it, it is also possible to get all other Betty numbers uh, very easily. And as a matter of fact, that is exactly what we do uh, in our project. So the first Betty number getting there was like a good place to start. And uh, some sort of a historical context on this would uh, is like, so for, for two generated semi-groups, uh, what we have is that the presentation ideal is principal. And once again, this can be seen using the auslander bushbaum theorem or Bushbaum's formula. Um, in 1970, Herzog was able to prove that for three generated semi-group, uh, the presentation ideal is generated by at most three elements. And in 1975, Brzezinski was the first person to show that when H is greater than or equal to four, presentation ideal can be generated by, uh, you know, the mu can be arbitrarily large. It can be generated by arbitrarily large uh, number of elements. Uh, what that means is, what, uh, if you look at what Brzezinski did, that, that becomes clear. Um, so what Brzezinski did was he took these four numbers, uh, I mean, param parametrized by this variable n, um, <clears throat> and he looked at the semigroup there, and he was able to show that mu is equal to 2n. So essentially, if you change n, mu changes, and of course, since n could be arbitrarily large, mu can be arbitrarily large. And soon after Brzezinski uh, published this paper, um, I think I would give a couple of years before Arslan uh, considered his own semigroup generated by these four elements and was again able to prove that mu is 2n plus 2. Again, since n as a parameter can be arbitrarily large, mu can be arbitrarily large here. Um, 
But a good thing to notice is mu is even in both of the examples. So a very natural question that we were asking ourselves is, is there an example where mu is odd while being arbitrarily large? And we searched for quite a bit. And actually, this type of example was very hard to find in the literature. And in 2017, Stamate released this uh, really nice paper. It's kind of like a survey on what has been done in uh, semi-group ring theory. And uh, it's like he, it's a collection of a lot of results from a lot of different authors. And in one of, uh, in one of the results that Stamate had there, he considered this uh, semi-group called Bakel and semi-group. It was first studied by uh, these three people called Froberg, Hagvist, and uh, I forgot the other one. But um, yeah, these three people studied this semi-group and they were studying it because it was the first example with uh, unbounded type, but a fixed embedding dimension, which is four, right? Uh, so they were studying it for that reason. But what Stamate was able to do was produce the Betty sequence of this particular semigroup. And uh, this Betty sequence he obtained through computations using singular and gap. Uh, but an interesting thing to notice is that the, se the first Betty number is three and plus four. And which means this is a potential example where mu can be odd while arbitrarily large. So if n is an arbitrarily large odd number, then mu is an arbitrarily large odd number, which is great. So a realistic goal there came to view. So initially the goals of the project was to just produce this explicit minimal generating set for i of h and therefore show that mu is indeed three n plus four. Um, this was a great observation, but it wasn't particularly a result because there was no actual proof of this. He just claimed that this is the Betty sequence and he sort of moved on. Uh, but since there was no proof, we just decided to uh, prove that it is 3n plus 4. And to get there, we wanted to produce this explicit minimal generating set. And once we did that, we were looking at the other Betty numbers. And it wasn't a very long shot to compute the type from uh, the minimal generating set now that we had it. So we were able to do that. And after getting the type and confirming that the Betty sequence is what Stamade had said in his paper, we were playing around with it for a little bit, and we were also able to show that uh, the Bakel and semigroup ring is of homogeneous type. And that means the Betty numbers of the semigroup ring coincide with the Betty numbers of its tangent cone. So, uh, so these are the goals of the project, and this is what we ended up uh, accomplishing, really. Uh, so for the setup of this particular uh, project is like similar to what we saw before, but in uh, in this particular context, we have the semi-group and then we send X to T to the, the first uh, element of the generators and then so on and so forth. And we say that the presentation ideal or the defining ideal is the kernel of this map. Um, and this is graded under the non-standard grading that uh, I mentioned. And mu is the cardinality of the minimal generated uh, oh, another important thing to notice is that mu is the cardinality of any minimal set of graded generators for I of H. And this was, uh, again, another result produced by Stamade in his paper, where he said you can take any minimal set of graded generators and they'll have the same cardinality. So mu can represent any minimal set of graded generators. Uh, and this was uh, the minimal generating set that we were able to find. A lot of this was inspired by running a few examples in uh, softwares like Macaulay too. And probably if I have time towards the end, I'll show you an example of how I did it. But it, it took a lot of looking at discrete examples to get a feel for the density of different types of things in the minimal generating set. Um, once we had a general idea, we had to think about how this could be the minimal generating set. And in order to prove that, we really had to prove two different things. The fact that this, uh, these four sets uh, actually generates the defining ideal or the presentation ideal of the semi-group ring. So that's the question of generatability. But then once we show that, we also have the question of minimality to consider. So we wanted to show that if it's a generating set, then it's also a minimal generating set. 
Um, um, and once we have that it's a minimal generating set, then we are able to compute the type and then confirm that the sequence of very numbers is uh, these four numbers. So proving theorem one is kind of long and it's, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's ad hoc, but it's, it's just long and tedious because you have to consider different uh, types. So I'll reserve that for the end of the talk. So what we can now do, what I can now do is pro pro provide like an outline of the proof of theorem two assuming theorem one. Um, Theorem 2 also uses this other very powerful theorem by Herzog uh, that I'm going to outline in the next few slides. So Herzog's theorem, like again, uh, this is sort of a reminder of what the initial form are, uh, which is just essentially, again, the non-zero homogeneous part of least degree under the standard grading. And then you could produce like um, uh, a standard basis for I if their initial form uh, generate the ideal of initial forms. And what Herzog's theorem says is this. So these are all just preliminary setups where we have an ideal inside this maximum, where we have an I inside this maximal ideal and a polynomial ring. Uh, we, sh we assume that the first variable or at least one of the variables is a non-zero divisor in uh, the power series ring modded out with by I uh, inside the power series ring. And we consider this homomorphism. This is like the important part of this theorem. This, what the, the variable to itself. And we denote um, I bar as the image of I. And what we, what it says is really almost like magic here. If we have a standard basis in I bar, which is basically the image. So G1 to GR form a standard basis for I bar, which is the image of I. And we have a bunch of Fs in the I, such that pi maps to GI, pi of F phi is GI, and the initial forms match up. Then we have that the original functions form a standard basis for I. So uh, this is incredible because Let's say we have like a conjectural generating set for I and the, uh, you know, ensuring that this forms a standard basis and therefore a minimal set now boils down to just studying the images and the images under the right uh, map when you send the right variable to zero could be really, really simple. And that is exactly what ended up happening to our example as we'll see in a second. But Herzog's theorem also provides uh, some other auxiliary um, results that we'd use later on, where it says that if X1 is a non-zero divisor here, X1 is also a non-zero divisor in this uh, associated graded ring of S mod I, uh, uh, and we have this KL, very nice K-algebra isomorphism. Um, so using Herzog's theorem, we can actually end up, end up showing the minimality. Uh, so what we did is in our particular example, uh, let me find it here, uh, we chose to, well, we were able to send one variable to zero and we chose to send W to zero. And what nice things happen when sending W to zero is that the image I bar is, would, be end, uh, would end up being generated by a bunch of monomials. So I bar becomes a monomial ideal and studying monomial ideals and computing stuff for monomial ideals are a lot easier than other things, which is why the Herzog's theorem was, was very powerful and very useful in in our proof. So, since this is a monomial ideal, and if you if you look at the generators, uh, there's n, n, and n plus one, two, three, four of them. So three and plus four generators, with none of them non-overlapping. Like uh, this y z cube does not divide any other monomial in the image. So they form a minimal set of generators of I bar. Um, and the cardinality is three n plus four. Uh, uh, by Herzog's theorem, then the pre-images of these things also uh, generate i. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, it's also important that uh, the pre-images uh, generate i is given by theorem one. Sorry, I, I should have mentioned that. From theorem one, the defining ideal is I itself. And so the pre-image also form a generating set. 
and the cardinality is three and plus four. So it has to be a minimal generating set because of Herzog's theorem. Um, so that's very nice. And once we have this, uh, we can also prove part two of the theorem, which uh, ends up computing the type of K of H. So the type of K of H, if you think about it, is the same as the type of I bar because the Betty numbers are preserved under this uh, map, right? So all we have to do is find the type of I bar. So again, it's a, I bar is a monomial ideal. So we'll find a set B of monomials whose images would form a basis for this. And it can be seen that, I mean, again, this took a lot of trial and error and actually studying these monomials will be able to get these monomials. They have non-zero images because uh, none of them are in X, Y, Z yet. Um, and what we can do is if we take an arbitrary monomial in this uh, uh, basis set, and what we, we can just uh, sort of study each case. Well, C it has to be less than three and minus two because we have a three and minus one here. And then if it was three and minus one, we would go into X, Y, Z. So again, um, we see has to be less than three and minus two. So we can study this on a case by case basis. And I think after like C equals three or four, you just exhaust all other possible types and you say none of the other things are possible. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward proof. It's just a little tedious to write out, uh, but it can be checked. Uh, so, and if you look at the cardinality of this set, it ends up being three and plus two. So the type of K of H, which is the same as the type of I bar is three and plus two. So now that we have the zero first and the third Betty numbers in hand, and we know that the alternating sum of the Betty numbers is zero, um, be, uh, beta two is straightforward uh, to be six n plus five, and this confirms uh, Stamate's uh, proof that uh, that is the Betty sequence. So that's uh, the proof of theorem two, which is very nice. Um, and as a nice corollary to uh, theorem two, what we can uh, also say is that the first one is a, a very trivial thing, the fact that uh, the set that we had, the lambda set we had, forms a standard basis, which is just a direct consequence of Herzog's theorem. But the, the nicer part is part two, which says that if you have uh, the Betty numbers of K of H, the Betty numbers of the associated tangent, uh, they, they both coincide. And this proof is really similar to the proof of theorem two. Um, this part, except we would send x to zero instead of w to zero. Uh, it only matters here uh, because we would want some of the extra hypothesis in Herzog's theorem uh, part three to be satisfied. Um, but initially we didn't send x to zero because if we sent x to zero, this ideal didn't end up being uh, monomial, it was a binomial. There was a binomial in there and that threw a wrench in all, all of our calculations. So we didn't want to do that. So we just did it two different times, except this one was a lot similar to the previous time. So we said it's possible. So um, it's straightforward to show that the Betty numbers are preserved under here as well. Uh, so this is a very nice corollary. So this proves that uh, K of H is a homogeneous type. I actually also came across a different proof of this, but I'm not, uh, while I was actually preparing for this talk, but I'm not completely sure about it yet. It uses a, the, another theorem about uh, the cyclicity of the Betty numbers. There's a theorem that says that for uh, K large enough, uh, you could, uh, I mean, so you have the, uh, the semi-group that is generated by four elements, and if you add, one L, uh, if you add a number, uh, a number uniformly to all four elements, and if the number is large enough, uh, the uh, the Betty numbers start being cyclic, and that's a very nice result. I think uh, my proof holds, but I need to cross check with my mentor on that. But yeah, that's a different way of proving the same thing that we did here. Um, but again, all of this proof was centered on proving this theorem one, the fact that the set that we just came up with uh, from observation actually generates the presentation ideal. So 
again, as mentioned before, the presentation ideal is generated by binomials. And since we're actually looking at the sets, we can get our, get our hands dirty and actually write uh, the general form of the binomial out where this equality is satisfied. Uh, we're going to call D to be the total degree of the binomial under this induced grading. So this would be the degree of uh, the binomial. Since IH is a prime ideal, um, each binomial can be assumed to be a difference of non-overlapping monomials. So what, that, what does that mean? So let's say I have this binomial such that I have a y to the something here, y to the nu2 and y to the mu2 here. And with our laws of generality, let's just say nu2 is bigger than mu2. Then what I can do is I can just factor out y to the mu2 and uh, end up with a smaller binomial uh, with uh, no uh, y here, right? And since i h is prime, it only um, boils down to uh, considering the binomial without the y here, um, right? So again, each binomial can be then thought of similarly as the difference of non-overlapping monomials. So if you have a monomial here, you can rest assured that that monomial doesn't appear here, it's something completely different. So let's say we have i be generated by the lambda, which is uh, our generating set. And it's clear that i is inside the presentation ideal because each of the elements of lambda is inside the presentation ideal. So we just need to show that any arbitrary binomial in the presentation ideal is inside i, right? And what we do is uh, do an induction on uh, this total degree or the homogeneous degree. And the way we do that is as follows. So let's say we have a homogeneous degree that's bigger than one, and we have this binomial that is of degree D. Then this binomial is either already in I, which is good because that's what we're trying to prove, or it's in the ideal generated by binomials in the presentation ideal that of degree that is strictly less than D. Right, so essentially, if the binomial satisfies the second condition, we will say that it reduces to a lower degree. So you can think of it as if you take a binomial in the presentation ideal, it's either already in I or it can be reduced. And then that reduced binomial can I is already in I and it, or it can further be reduced. And that's how the induction goes. And our analysis considers all possible types of binomials in I assumed non-overlapping. So what does that mean? Uh, we take binomials in the presentation ideal and we sort of categorize them into types like, like x to the new one, y to the new two, z to the mu three, minus z to the mu three, w to the mu four, and things like that. So we have different types of binomials. And uh, since we ran our examples in Macaulay, we kind of had an idea of how dense each type is in terms of producing generators. Like um, in, in in this particular Bacon case, uh, the, the first type ended up being the most dense because it produced that type had the most number of generators. And then this type was the second the most dense and so on. Um, so studying each type of binomials ended up studying expressions like this because that's it. at the end of the day, we want this new ice and mu ice, right? And now if we want to get our hands dirtier, we can actually expand this out and write it in its full generality. And after we write that here, we kind of move things around and use properties of these four numbers to get to a lower bound of the total degree of monomials under the standard grading. And what does that mean? Well, in this particular example, we ended up showing that uh, new one plus new two is greater than or equal to r plus two and mu three plus mu four is greater than or equal to r plus one. So things like this, uh, inequalities like this, uh, we, we ended up abusing them so that, uh, uh, by, so that we could end up parameterizing each of the mu's and the mu's. Uh, for example, we, we did something like, so nu one can be written as r plus two, um, um, minus k and mu2 was k and and things like that so uh so using these bounds we were able to uh parameterize the news and mu's maybe my parameterization there was wrong now that i think about it but we did something like that i just forgot what the exact 
parameterization was. Um, but then once we had that, we used uh, sort of modular arguments to reduce the homogeneous degree of binomials, um, which uh, then the induction took care of. So an example of this thing in action would be, let's say we have this binomial in uh, the presentation ideal. So we have these two nice binomials in Lambda. So what we can now do is sort of reduce this binomial into something else of a lower homogeneous degree. And we do that by sort of finding the closest relative to one of these uh, monomials, in this case, uh, z to the 6n plus 1, z to the 3n minus 1. They're pretty close relatives. And we were able to sort of write a linear combination so that the resulting binomial will have a homogeneous degree that's less. And at this point, we can just say that the induction takes care of it. But if you want to go one step further, we can take this because this particular binomial is not in lambda. So it's in the presentation ideal, though. So we take this and then we write it as a linear combination uh, with its closest relative, in this case, again, z to the 3 and minus 1. And at the end of the day, we end up with the binomial that ends up being in lambda. So now we know that at each step, the homogeneous degree of the binomial has dropped. And working backwards, we can actually show that this thing is also in, uh, can be written as, you know, combinations of stuff from lambda. So it's in I, really. So that's essentially uh, like an example or like an illustration of how the induction works and how the, the machinery fits together. But in no way is, is it actually a, a straightforward proof. Um, but that's essentially how the proof works. I didn't want to include the proof because it would uh, involve like a lot of different types and a lot of different cases and pretty ugly expressions like this. But um, rest assured that it ends up being, it ends up working in the end. Um, as for future directions in this area, um, there's definitely a need for better theoretical framework that helps produce other examples. And what I mean by this is um, we have studied the Bakelin's example and Bakelin semigroup ring in this uh, particular project. And people have studied Brzezinski's and Arslan semigroup. But a lot of themes in, the, in this area of research is that when given an example of a semigroup, people are able to find properties of the semigroup that uh, they satisfy and are able to prove things about the semigroup. But there is no way that given a property, we can uh, essentially arrive at a semigroup that satisfies that property. Like we want to be able to have a better theoretical framework that produces such examples and says, hey, this is an example with the, the first uh, arbitrarily large odd number of generators and, and things like that. Uh, but that's a, a little bit more of an ambitious goal as of now because there's not, not a lot of machinery that's developed in this area. But a very uh, palpable and very attainable result is uh, the next one is by finding a minimal generating set that also serves as a Gerbner base. Grobner basis. Um, what I mean by this is, uh, remember I said any minimal graded set of generators uh, have the same uh, cardinality, right? So what I can do is I can go back and change the writing of my presentation ideal and in a way that the resulting presentation ideal serves as a Gerbner basis. And the good thing about having a Gerbner basis is that it ends up helping us easily produce a minimal free resolution. And people have done this time and again with the Brzezinski semigroup, with the Arslan semigroups. And this is like a, a kind of a theme where people prove something about a semigroup and then there's later works on finding the minimal free resolution of it. Um, so this is definitely the next stopping point uh, for anyone doing uh, research related to semigroup rings or the Bakel and semigroup because this is a very attainable result that hasn't been done before. And, and that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me. I can take questions. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can ask.
Okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So, uh, do you see any geometric uh, interpretation of the result? Uh, in the sense that uh, you have achieved information about the Betty numbers and uh, other important data which are, have a lot of geometric significance. Do you see any geometric application of this class? Yeah, uh, there are a bunch of geometric applications. Uh, I can't, well, I can't think of one uh, off the top of my head, but I am uh, I know that my mentor is working on uh, like stuff related to uh, uh, rational cones and uh, the Forbenius number of different types of semi-groups actually ends up manifesting itself very naturally into, into those structures, but I'm not quite sure how that works yet. So I can't, you know, quantitatively answer that question just yet, but the, um, there is definitely an application there. And um, there are other like uh, applications in discrete algebra uh, where we can talk about, how, how can I explain this? Like you can talk about simplices that, um, that are formed by elements of the semigroups. I mean, I wouldn't even say simplex, but it's something related to that. I, again, I'm kind of at loss because I haven't looked at the geometric aspect a whole lot, but I know that there's a lot of relations. So I'll definitely follow this up uh, after talking to my mentor. Are Resner ideas, which are formed yeah, yeah. issue complex? Yeah, yeah I, I think so, yeah. Fine. But uh, I'm not quite sure yet, so don't take me at, at my word there, but I'll yeah. definitely follow up with the answers properly. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there yeah. is uh, no further questions, uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, uh, I'll, st uh, I'll stop recording and you can find this video on YouTube by tomorrow. Uh, okay. Thank you. I'll announce yeah. more talks further in the Discord server. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.